Thank you for inviting me to make this presentation. We're going to start with some basic astronomy to describe how the Greeks conceived of the universe, talk a little bit about the development of star maps, and then describe the figures on Grand Central Station ceiling, and, there, and I'll tell you a bit about their mythology, and then I'll show you a few constellations that you can easily see this summer for yourselves. I'll also show you some of the beautiful celestial objects in these constellations. It's easy to believe that the Earth is the center of the universe and that the Sun, planets, and stars revolve around it. The Sun crosses the sky from east to west every day. The animation on the left is what we see. The stars are invisible during the day because of Earth's bright blue sky, which occurs because blue wavelengths of sunlight are scattered more efficiently by molecules high in the atmosphere than the longer, redder wavelengths, a process known as Rayleigh scattering. On the right, I've removed the atmosphere to show the path of the sun against the stars for one day. This animation, by the way, is for June 3rd, just last week. This model of the cosmos is attributed to Aristotle. He described it in his work On the Heavens, although it was developed before his time. The planets and the stars were thought to reside on rigid crystalline spheres propelled by the prime mover who was actually outside the sphere of the stars. The Greek astronomer Aristarchus of Samos proposed that the Sun was at the center of the universe, but he had no clear proof, and his idea didn't catch on at the time. The annual path of the Sun against the stars is called the ecliptic. The Greeks knew the stars were very far away compared to the planets, and assumed that they were essentially on the back wall of the heavens. The positions of the brightest stars had been known since Babylonian times, and you could figure out the sun's position against the starry background, even though it was daytime. The Greeks knew that the Earth was a sphere, and they also knew that the ecliptic was tilted relative to the plane of the Earth's equator, even though they had never ventured far enough south to reach the equator. The plane of the ecliptic and the plane of the Earth's equator cross in March and September. And when the sun passes through those points, we get the vernal and autumnal equinoxes when the length of day and night are equal. The sun and the planets appear to move against the background of the stars. This would be true whether the sun revolved around the earth or the earth revolved around the sun because the stars are so far away. This animation shows the path of the sun for this entire year, capturing one frame every day at 12 noon. The Sun defines the ecliptic, and the planes of the orbits of the planets around the Sun and of the Moon around the Earth are relatively close to it. You can easily see the monthly pass of the Moon through the sky. The Moon's orbit is tilted from the ecliptic by just over 5 degrees. Mercury's orbit is inclined by 7 degrees and Venus is by 3.4 degrees. The orbits of the other planets are much closer to the ecliptic plane except for Pluto at 17 degrees. But of course, that's if you believe that it's a planet, and that whole controversy is for another talk. Ancient civilizations made star patterns and figures from the stars. Literacy was not common, but the sky allowed people to organize and remember their myths. By the 5th century BC, a range of myths were attached to each of the constellations, and they were the subject of all sorts of poetic and dramatic retellings. The constellations along the ecliptic are known as the zodiac. The Babylonians codified the zodiacal constellations by the middle of the first millennium, assigning generic figures to them such as the ram, the crab, and the scales. The Greeks eventually organized the sky into a map of 48 constellations, plotted the ecliptic, and they recognized the Milky Way. It was undoubtedly irresistible for their writers and poets to weave mythology around the constellations all over the heavens. Of course, the Greeks had no exclusivity for this. All cultures had their own sky stories. But the Greek sky map is the one that's the basis for what became the official atlas of the sky. The first astronomy textbook that we know about was the Phenomena of Aratus, a poem written about 275 BC that described the constellations and various natural phenomena, such as weather, associated with their positions in the heavens but it did not relate their myths. 
It is said to be a verse setting of a lost work of the same name by Eudoxus, a student of Plato and a contemporary of Aristotle. Eudoxus was the originator of the theory of circular planetary motion with epicycles and deference that, came, that held sway in astronomy for almost two millennia. About 60 to 70 years after Aratus's poem, Eratosthenes, the chief librarian at Alexandria and one of the most learned men of antiquity, wrote a commentary on Aratus, which included myths for each of the 48 constellations in the Greek sky. Among his other accomplishments, Eratosthenes accurately measured the circumference of the earth and determined the tilt of the earth's axis. In 150 AD, Claudius Ptolemy in Alexandria wrote an encyclopedic book of mathematical astronomy in Greek called the Mathematicae Syntaxis. The original text is lost, but it has survived in many Arabic translations and subsequently in Latin. It is known by its Arabic name, the Almagest, meaning the magisterial or the greatest. It is the final refinement of Eudoxus's theory Star positions provide a reference grid for plotting the movements of the sun, moon, and planets, which move on circular motion. Many of these positions came from measurements by Hipparchus, the greatest of the Greek astronomers, who codified them in 129 BC. Hipparchus's original text is lost, however, and we know of his work primarily through Ptolemy. The Almagest was the astronomy textbook for nearly 1,500 years spinning off many commentaries and summaries. For example, Peter Apian's Cosmographia, published in 1524, contains rotating calculating engines made of paper disks and string, working like circular slide rules. The mathematical treatment in the Almagest and reflected in the Cosmographia was sufficiently accurate for most purposes, but as celestial measuring instruments improved, predictions deviated from the actual motions of the planets against the stars and there were inaccuracies regarding the predictions of eclipses and the brightnesses of planets at various points in their orbits. The Polish Catholic cleric, physician, and mathematician Nicholas Copernicus proposed an alternative mathematical schema with the sun at the center. First in 1513, and then finally in his book De Revolutionibus, the proofs of which were brought to him on his deathbed. The Revolutionibus is rivaled only by Newton's Principia Mathematica and Darwin's Origin of Species for its impact on the course of science. Actual proof that the Earth revolved around the Sun was obtained by Galileo in 1610 when he observed the phases of Venus. In spite of this evidence, minds changed slowly, especially in Catholic countries, because the idea ran contrary to several passages in Scripture. The scientifically minded Jesuits enthusiastic over Galileo's initial telescopic discoveries, campaigned actively against heliocentrism until the end of the 17th century. The pictorial record of the location of stars and constellations in a spherical universe begins with the Farnese Atlas, the oldest celestial globe. It shows the locations and forms of the constellations. It was found buried in a vineyard in Rome in 1505, not far from where the Trevi Fountain is now located. It's a Roman copy of a Greek original. It was bought by Cardinal Alessandro Farnese in 1562, and we're told he paid, <coughs> excuse me, he paid 250 scudi for it. And it's now in Naples with the rest of the Farnese statues. To see the figures on a solid sphere, we have to imagine that we're outside of the Aristotelian universe. This is sometimes called the God's Eye View for obvious reasons. Bradley Schaefer, an astronomer at Louisiana State University, believes that the constellations on the globe were positioned explicitly using Hipparchus's now lost star tables, but only a few other historians of astronomy support this view. The first printed star map was drawn by the famous artist Albrecht Durer and published in 1515. Surprisingly, it's a God's eye view rather than a map you can hold up when looking at the sky, although I suspect it was a prototype for a celestial globe and therefore would be appropriately printed uh, in the God's eye view. There are three hand-colored versions in existence, one sold at auction in 2011 for over three quarters of a million dollars. 
If we turn it upside down, we can see the constellations that are on the ceiling at Grand Central, from Aquarius on the left to Cancer on the right. Dura made Cancer the Crab look more like Cancer the Lobster, however. The ceiling over the football field size concourse was originally going to be a skylight, but practical considerations resulted in a closed barrel vault roof. The star map was the inspiration of architect Whitney Warren and artist Paul Cesar Helou. A number of artists worked on the ceiling, which showed a section of the zodiac and a swath of the Milky Way. The 63 brightest stars were originally illuminated by electric light bulbs. On January 29, 1913, the New York Times ran the story, Grand, Grand Central Terminal opening on Sunday, men working day and night to finish main section of the Great Station. The article states, The view presented is a section of the heavens seen from October to March, from Aquarius to Cancer. Extending across the ceiling from east to west are two broad bands of gold, representing the ecliptic and the equator. The figures and signs in their relation to one another and to the ecliptic and equator are as nearly as possible astronomically correct. To ensure astronomical accuracy and beauty of form, the highest authorities were consulted, among them Dr. Harold Jacobi of Columbia University. It is safe to say that many school children will go to Grand Central Terminal to study this representation of the heavens. But it wasn't long after GCT's opening on February 2, 1913, that an astronomically knowledgeable commuter noticed that the constellations were backwards. What was painted was the God's Eye View, as seen in the Albrecht Durer print. This is the way the ceiling should be oriented if we are looking up at the sky, not down on it. The postdoc explanation offered by the GCT leadership after the error was discovered was that they wanted to show the external view, but this is cl clearly belied by their own words in the Times article. The presumption is that the images were projected on the ceiling for the artist to trace, and someone forgot to recognize that in doing so, they were flipped. But as we will see, that's not the entire story. However, we do have to look at the ceiling as it is presented to us, so we'll return it to its actual position. The dashed line along which the constellations are arrayed is the ecliptic, and the solid line is the celestial equator, which is actually slightly malpositioned. In Orion, it ought to be going across his waist. Also, Pegasus is a bit farther away from Aquarius than he ought to be. Where did these images on the ceiling come from? The southern skies were unknown until the early 16th century, when Spanish and Portuguese explorers voyaged below the equator. Vasco da Gama, sailing around the Cape of Good Hope in 1497, and Ferdinand Magellan around Cape Horn in 1519. Only a few southern stars were roughly charted on these voyages. Petrus Plancius, a cartographer and one of the founders of the Dutch East India Company, made a celestial globe in 1589 that showed the large and small Magellanic clouds, but otherwise the deeper southern skies were relatively blank. Plancius asked Peter Dirksen Kaiser to plot southern star positions during the first voyage of the company to Sumatra in 1595 under the captaincy of Cornelius de Hootman. Kaiser, the navigator, did most of his observations from Madagascar, plotting about 120 new stars and 12 new constellations. De Hootman returned to Holland in 1597 with only 81 of the original 248 crew, Kaiser not among them, and most of them dying of scurvy. Plancius made a new celestial globe in 1598 from the data that de Hootman brought. It was published by cartographer Jokodus Handius, but no copies of that globe survive. The new southern stars and constellations were incorporated into Johann Bayer's Uranometria, generally regarded as the first complete stellar atlas. It was published in 1603. The word Uranometria derives from Urania, who was the muse of the heavens, Uranos being the Greek word for sky. Bayer incorporated the star positions of Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, who had made exceedingly accurate measurements of star and planetary positions from 1582 to 1597 from his observatory on the island of Haven 
not far from Copenhagen, correcting positions that had been in use since the time of Ptolemy. The first object on the ceiling that we'll discuss is the band of gold depicting the Milky Way. There's nothing more dramatic in a dark sky than the Milky Way, the name we give to our galaxy. It's a collection of perhaps 400 billion stars, as well as gas and dust, arrayed in a grand spiral so large it takes 120,000 years for a light beam to cross it. It's generally believed that our galaxy looks like this. We're just a little under halfway from the center to the edge in one of the spiral arms. The Greeks have a great origin story for the Milky Way. Heracles, Hercules by his Roman name, was the son of Zeus and the mortal Alcmene. In order for a son of Zeus by a mortal woman to become immortal, he had to suckle at Hera's breast. Now Hera was not happy that Zeus was going around seducing women all over the planet, so she refused to nurse Heracles. On Zeus's instruction, Hermes took the infant and placed him at Hera's breast while she was sleeping. When she awoke, she was startled to find Heracles nursing, pulled him away, and spilled her milk across the sky. The Greek word for milk is gala, and from that we get the word galaxy. The Greeks formally called it a milky circle. Our English term is a direct translation of the Latin via lactea. The water carrier represented by the constellation Aquarius is Ganymede, a beautiful youth. Ganymede was the son of Tros, the king of Troy. While tending his father's flocks on Mount Ida, Ganymede was spotted by Jupiter. The king of the gods became, became enamored of the boy and flew down to the mountain in the form of a large bird, whisking Ganymede away to the heavens. Ever since, the boy has ser served as the cupbearer to the gods. In the Metamorphoses, Ovid makes Ganymede a girl who serves Juno, the Roman name for Hera. And, of course, Ganymede is the name given to one of the satellites of Jupiter. Uranometria is a geocentric atlas showing the stars and constellations as they would be seen from Earth, as a useful sky map ought to be oriented. Here's Aquarius as Bayer drew him, then rotated to match the ceiling, and then overlaid with the figure's outlines done with Photoshop from a photograph that I took in December. Subsequent star atlases made Aquarius into a more innocent youth than Bayer, removing his goatee. I'll be showing you some star maps that I made using a very powerful free computer program called Carte du Ciel that you can download. The brown lines show the constellation boundaries that were set by the International Astronomical Union in 1930. Among the deep sky objects in Aquarius are two globular star clusters, dense collections of hundreds of thousands of stars. They surround the galaxy at distances of tens of thousands of light years from its center. Globulars appear to have formed along with the galaxy 12 billion years ago. In addition, Aquarius contains a very beautiful, often photographed planetary nebula, the helix. This is made of gas from an old sun-like star that has run out of nuclear fuel, thrown off its outer layers, and collapsed into a hot white dwarf, whose radiation heats the gas and makes it fluoresce. This will happen to our sun in about five billion years. The Messier designations come from the first catalog of non-stellar objects published in 1784 by the French astronomer Charles Messier. NGC stands for New General Catalog, a much more comprehensive catalog published a hundred years later. It has about 8,000 non-stellar objects. Here are the images of Pisces and Aries on the Grand Central Stealing. Again, mirror images of Bayer. Aphrodite once visited Syria with her son Eros, and she arrived beside the river Euphrates. All of a sudden, Typhon, a primordial monster who revolted after Zeus defeated the Titans, appeared. Aphrodite and Eros hurled themselves into the river to escape, turning themselves into fishes. Zeus eventually struck Typhon down with a thunderbolt, and one extension of the legend has Zeus burying him under Mount Etna, 
so that the eruptions of Mount Etna are Typhon trying to get out. Ares represents the ram of the Golden Fleece, sought by Jason and the Argonauts. The ram had originally been presented to Nephili by Hermes when her husband took a new wife, Eno, who persecuted Nephili's children, Phrixus and Helle. To keep them safe, Nephili put them on the back of the magical ram who flew away to the east. Helle fell off into the Hellespont, the old name for the Dardanelles between the Aegean Sea and the Sea of Marmara, but Phrixus safely made it to Colchis on the eastern shore of the Black Sea. Phrixus sacrificed the ram and presented the Golden Fleece to the king, Aetes. This part of the sky is rich in galaxies and galaxy clusters because it's offset from the plane of the Milky Way, so our view to them is not blocked by local stars and dust. Galaxies are mostly spirals, but there are also elliptical galaxies such as NGC 474 that have lost their spiral arms, generally due to collisions with other galaxies over billions of years. These galaxies are all about 75 to 100 million light years away, which means that the light we see started its path to our eyes when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. Taurus and Orion are having a face-off, but this pairing is quite strange given the use of Bayer's Atlas for the figures because Orion on the ceiling is not the god's eye view. He's drawn exactly as Bayer drew him without any rotation. Interestingly, Bayer has Orion facing away from Taurus. The two plates in the Uranographia are to the same scale, so it was easy to Photoshop them and register. It seems odd for the great hunter to turn his back on a charging beast. On his 1624 celestial globe, a direct inheritance from the Plancius globe of 1598, Hondius has him facing Taurus. In all subsequent representations of Orion and Taurus in star atlases, they're facing each other. This particular globe, by the way, is the same globe pictured in Vermeer's 1668 painting, The Astronomer. It's in the wing of the Louvre that sane people go in order to avoid the crowds by the Mona Lisa, which is exactly how my wife and I came across it on a visit a few years ago. Taurus represents the bull whose form was taken by Zeus when he became enamored of Europa, princess of Phoenicia. Europa was impressed by the beauty and gentleness of the bull, and the two played together on the beach. Eventually, Europa climbed onto the bull's back, and he swam out to sea with her. He took her to Crete and revealed his true self. She became the first queen of Crete. An extension of this story involves her son Minos, his monster the Minotaur, and the Labyrinth, which leads further to Daedalus, the designer of the Labyrinth, and his son Icarus, and then to Theseus and Ariadne, but we haven't got the time to follow all these wonderful leads and connections in Greek mythology. The representation in most celestial atlases seems to show a raging bull, always about to gore Orion, but this doesn't reflect the gentle seductive bull in Ovid's telling of the story in the Metamorphoses. This British 19th century image, part of the set of constellation cards marketed as a Christmas gift for mass consumption in 1824, seems to show a more happy, contented animal, although all of the images I've shown you are really clones of Bayer's original. The hunter Orion was the most handsome of men. He was the son of the sea god Poseidon and Euryale, the daughter of King Minos. In Homer's Odyssey, Orion is described as exceptionally tall and armed with an unbreakable bronze club. Except for Bayer, as we mentioned, Orion is shown facing the attack of Taurus. But there are no Greek myths that tell of the relationship between Orion and Taurus. They're completely independent in terms of their mythical history. There are many myths involving Orion. In one of the most commonly cited, Orion fell in love with the Pleiades, the seven sisters, daughters of Atlas and Pleione. He started pursuing them. Zeus scooped them up and placed them in the sky. The Pleiades are represented by the famous star cluster of the same name, located in the constellation Taurus. Orion can still be seen chasing the sisters across the sky at night. There are two myths about Orion's death. One involves a scorpion, possibly sent on purpose by Artemis or Hera, or encountered while trying to protect his mother. These myths share the same celestial outcome. 
Orion and the Scorpion were placed on opposite sides of the sky, so that when the constellation Scorpius rises in the east, Orion sets in the west, fleeing the Scorpion. It's possible that their opposite locations created the linkage and myth, and not the other way around. In another myth, Artemis is in love with Orion. Her brother Apollo objects to the relationship. He goads her into an archery contest. She is, after all, the goddess of the hunt. She points out a distant object for him to aim at, which he hits with an arrow, but it turns out to be Orion, who is killed. Orion and Taurus contain some of the most observed objects in the winter sky. The Pleiades is a cluster of young stars surrounded by dust. It's easily visible with the naked eye and the subject of interesting myths in every culture on Earth. A wonderful Kiowa myth parallels the Greek story that I've already told you. Seven maidens were threatened by giant bears. The Great Spirit created the Devil's Tower in Wyoming to place them beyond the bear's reach. But the bears climbed the mesa, gouging out the tower's well-known vertical grooves with their claws. So the Great Spirit placed the maidens in the sky permanently out of the bear's reach. The horsehead and flame nebulas near the leftmost star in Orion's belt are frequently photographed by amateurs. And the Orion Nebula itself, some 1,344 light-years distant, is a large region of gas and dust within which active star formation is occurring. It's considered the greatest showpiece of the northern sky. The Crab Nebula is the ejecta of the supernova of 1054, which was observed and recorded by Chinese astronomers. In its center, there's a neutron star, the remains of the star that went supernova. It is smaller than Manhattan Island, but weighs more than the Sun. A teaspoon of it would weigh 10 million tons. The star rotates 30 times a second. A beam of energy created by its intense magnetic field passes across the Earth every 33 milliseconds. Slow down here in the image on the right so we can see it pulsate, which is why it's called a pulsar. Its shock waves from the magnetic field interacts with the ejected gas, and you can see that on the upper right. The last two zodiacal constellations on the ceiling are Gemini and Cancer. Gemini represents the twin brothers Castor and Pollux. Both were mothered by Leda and were therefore brothers of Helen of Troy, but they had different fathers. Leda was made pregnant by Zeus in the form of a swan and by her husband King Tyndarus of Sparta in the same night. Pollux, as the son of a god, was immortal and was renowned for his strength, while his mortal brother Castor was famous for his skill with horses. Both brothers voyaged in search of the Golden Fleece as Argonauts and then fought in the Trojan War to bring their sister home to her husband Menelaus. The most often given reason for their presence in the heavens is that Pollux was overcome with sorrow when his mortal brother died, and he begged Zeus to allow him to share his immortality. Zeus acknowledged the heroism of both, both brothers, consented, and reunited the pair in the heavens. Cancer is associated with the crab in the story of the Twelve Labors of Hercules. Hera, a sworn enemy of Hercules, sends the crab to distract the great hero while he is fighting the Lernian Hydra, a serpent-like beast with many heads and poisonous breath. When the crab tries to bite Hercules, Hercules kicks it all the way to the stars. In another version, the crab gets crushed instead and Hera places it in the sky as a reward for its efforts. However, she places the crab in a region of the sky that has no bright stars, because despite its efforts, the crab wasn't successful in accomplishing his task. This area of the sky has many open star clusters, groups of stars thought to have formed around the same time. In addition, Castor, the brightest star in Gemini, is a fine binary star. Triangulum is the first letter of the name of Zeus in Greek, delta for dios. It was placed in the sky by Hermes, who had responsibility of arranging the constellations. Bayer, however, only plotted one triangle, yet we see two and a fly. I found one photograph of the original ceiling taken prior to its replacement in 1945. The fly was there, 
If Professor Jacobi took his figures from Bayer, he must have added Muska from a later atlas, but we'll never know which one or why he did it. But pre-renovation, there was no small triangle. The renovation was needed because the ceiling had deteriorated from water damage and the smoke from cigarettes, cigars, and pipes. The beautiful shafts of light coming in from the south-facing windows in Berenice Abbott's 1936 photograph are only seen because of the vast number of tiny particles in the air. You can see the sorry state of the ceiling in the photograph. Triangulum minus was obviously added during the 1945 replacement and must have come, like Muska, from a later atlas. It couldn't have been due to Jacobi, who died in 1932. But who decided to add it, and why, we'll never know. Hondius' 1624 globe, based on Bayer's figures but reversed in the God's Eye view, only had the larger triangle. Muska was invented by Plancius in 1612 as Apis for B. Plancius plotted a Muska in the southern hemisphere, which has survived as a constellation to this day. Apis became Musca borealis, the northern fly, plotted by Johannes Hevelius, who added the second triangle in 1687. Hevelius was an important astronomer in the second half of the 17th century. He made the first good map of the moon in 1647. A wealthy Polish brewer, he became mayor of Gdansk and built a large observatory on top of his house. There seemed to be no Greek myths about the fly, although in Jacques Offenbach's humorous 1858 operetta Orpheus in the Underworld, Jupiter, the Roman Zeus, takes the form of a golden fly to seduce Eurydice. There's only one important deep sky object in Triangulum, the large Triangulum galaxy, Messier 33, sometimes called the Pinwheel. It's one of the closest large galaxies, close meaning about 2.8 million light years, or about 17 times 10 to the 18th miles, 17 examiles. It should not be surprising that new constellations were continually being added after the invention of the telescope allowed astronomers to observe fainter stars. By the early 19th century, all sorts of new constellations crowded sky maps. Here are just a few on one plate from Bode's Uranographia, published in 1801. The Scepter of the Brandenburgs, the Harp of King George III, a chemical apparatus, Alexander Volta's battery, a sculptor's table. This last one has survived as just plain sculptor. Almost all of the new constellations in the Northern Hemisphere that were inserted into star atlases in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries were eliminated in 1930 by the Interna International Astronomical Union, although many new southern constellations were adopted since there was no tradition of Greek astronomy for that area of the sky. Although not near the, near the ecliptic, the designers of the ceiling decided to show Pegasus, the winged horse, perhaps a reference to a train as an iron horse. In Greek times, Pegasus was associated with Bellerophon, who rode him to kill the fire-breathing dragon Shimmera. Bellerophon tried to fly up to the heavens, but fell off and was killed. The horse continued to fly up, and Zeus placed him among the stars. Subsequently, Pegasus became associated with the story of Perseus and Andromeda. Pegasus is easily recognized from the great square visible in the autumn. This is another area remote from the Milky Way, and so there are many galaxies in Pegasus and surrounding constellations. In 1923, Messier 31, known as the Andromeda Nebula because it's just across the border in Andromeda and we use the Great Square to help find it, was recognized by Edwin Hubble as being far beyond the Milky Way. It was proof that the Milky Way was not the only collection of stars in the universe, something that wasn't uniformly believed until that time. We now measure its distance as 2.5 million light years but it's getting closer and will collide with the Milky Way in about 3.5 billion years. This area of the sky displays the characters of the most coherent story in the heavens. It's a story also often portrayed in art. 
Perseus is holding the head of Medusa, which features Algol, an eclipsing binary star whose magnitude drops every 2.7 days, as one component of the system passes in front of the other. The name Algol comes from the Arabic for head of the ghoul, and Algol is sometimes called the demon star or Gorgona. The Chara Array, an interferometer at Mount Wilson in California, with a resolution 200 times better than the Hubble Space Telescope, can resolve the two stars even though they are only 6% of the Sun-Earth distance apart, at a distance of over 90 light years from Earth. The W of Cassiopeia is an easy to spot asterism, especially in the fall, when it is high in the sky. Because it's shaped like a W, we picked it for our club's logo. Queen Cassiopeia, the wife of King Cepheus of Ethiopia, was known for her beauty, but she was also known for her vanity. She often praised her own beauty, and she boasted that her daughter was far more beautiful than, than the Nereids, the sea nymphs. This made Poseidon very angry. Amphitrite, the eldest of the Nereids, was Poseidon's wife. He told the king that he would sac send the sea monster Cetus to destroy the city unless Andromeda was sacrificed. So Cepheus chained his daughter to a rock to await Cetus. The hero Perseus heard about the sacrifice. He intercepted and killed Cetus, freed Andromeda, and married her. Perseus was a son of Zeus, who appeared to his mother Danai in the form of a shower of gold. Unrelated to the Andromeda story, Perseus had been sent to kill the Gorgon, Medusa, who was a winged human female with snakes in her hair. She was so ugly that anyone who looked at her turned to stone. Perseus was given winged sandals and a special helmet by Hermes that made him invisible, and a special sickle from Hephaestos that he could use to kill Medusa without looking at her. He gave the head to the goddess Athena, who put it on her shield. Many versions of this tale have him riding Pegasus to save Andromeda, not just using the flying sandals. The Perseus Andromeda myth is richly represented in art ever since Greek times. Here are some examples. A wall painting at the Met from a villa outside of Naples. A painting in the Uffizi from 1510 by Piero di Cosimo. A beautiful plate with the arms of the Deste family and showing Perseus both using, flying in using his sandals and with Pegasus and the head of Medusa. One of several large paintings by Rubens showing the story. A Tiepolo that's in the Frick. Of course the famous statue by Benvenuto Cellini that's in Florence. Many of you perhaps have seen this. Another Rubens, this one just of the head of Medusa full of snakes, bugs, and even a salamander on the lower left. The head of Medusa has been an object of art since early Greek times. One of the most famous images is the Caravaggio that's in the Uffizi. As a takeoff on this, the Brazilian artist Vic Munez recreated it out of a plate of spaghetti and meat sauce. The 1981 movie Clash of the Titans features stop-motion animation by Ray Harryhausen. This was his last uh, movie. He's famous for many 1950s and 60s science fiction and adventure movies with all sorts of fantastic monsters. Harry Hamlin as Perseus holds up the head of Medusa, which not only has snakes, which actually move around, but green laser eyes. Here are some constellations that will be up in the summer sky, and you can look for them yourselves. The Great Bear didn't start out as a bear. The wood nymph Callisto was a maiden in the wild region of Arcadia. She was a huntress, one of Artemis's warriors, and she carried a light javelin or bow. Zeus caught sight of her and immediately desired her. He took the shape of Artemis and spoke to Callisto. She began to tell him of her hunting exploits, and he responded by seducing her. The Big Dipper, of course, is an asterism within the Great Bear, but it's only a small part of the constellation. Callisto bore a son to Zeus, Arcus, infuriating Hera. 
Out of jealousy, the wife of Zeus transformed the girl into a bear. She lived for a time in the wild until Arcas came across her one day while hunting. Unknowingly, he was about to kill his mother in bear form, but Zeus took mercy on Callisto, stayed Arcas's hand, and transformed him into the lesser bear. Zeus then placed both mother and son into the heavens as neighboring constellations. There are a lot of variations on this myth. Callisto, by the way, is also one of the satellites of Jupiter. We use the Big Dipper, called the Plow by the British, to find the North Star. Projecting a line from the pointer stars Merak and Dube, you can easily find Polaris, which is in, within one degree of the true pole. There are many galaxies in this part of the sky. My favorite is Messier 51, a pair of gravitationally interacting galaxies. Although it's officially in the constellation Canis Venatici, the hunting dogs, it's close to Ursa Major, and we use the handle of the Dipper to find it. M97, the Owl Nebula, is another planetary nebula, the remains of an exploded star. Hercules, the Greek Heracles, was driven mad by the gods and killed his sons. In penance, he went to Delphi, and the oracle tasked him to serve his cousin, King Eurysthenius, for ten years. The king gave him twelve labors over that time. Several of the labors are associated with the constellations Taurus, Leo, and Hydra, although there seem, these seem to be later associations. Here's the gigantic statue of Hercules from the Farnese collection in Naples. He's leaning on his club, over which a lion's skin is draped. Hercules' first and perhaps most famous labor was to kill the Nemean lion, whose skin was impenetrable, so he had to strangle it. He removed the lion's skin with its sharp fang, and it served as his shield. Here's Hercules defeating the multi-headed Lernaean Hydra. Note Cancer nipping at his heels. Zerberan portrays him, like Durer, more as a lobster than a crab. The asterism of the trapezoid is easy to spot overhead in the summer. Hercules contains two globular cl star clusters. Messier 13 is the largest cluster in the northern hemisphere and often a treat at summer star parties. The summer triangle is visible all summer and into the late fall. Its three bright stars, Vega, Deneb, and Altair, are easy to pick out even in light polluted skies. The Milky Way runs right through it. The triangle is an asterism made from three different constellations. Cygnus, the swan, represents the form Zeus took to seduce Leda, whom we mentioned as the mother of Castor and Pollux. Lyra is the lyre of Orpheus, which was first fashioned by Hermes. It belonged to the Muses, who gave it to Orpheus, the world's greatest musician. After Orpheus was torn to pieces by the Bacantes, no one could play it as well as he had, so it was placed in the heavens. Aquila is the eagle that snatched Ganymede and brought him to Olympus. This area of the sky has some beautiful objects that are hits at our summer star parties. Albireo, the second brightest star in Cygnus, is right in the middle of the triangle. It's a beautiful blue and gold double star, easy even in small telescopes. There are two famous planetary nebulas in this area, the Ring Nebula in Lyra, which is about two, uh, 1,600 years old, and the Dumbbell Nebula, called that because of its shape when seen through a small telescope. It's inside the triangle in the small faint constellation Vulpecula, the Little Fox. It's about 10,000 to 14,000 years old. The North American Nebula is a vast collection of hydrogen gas. It needs a dark sky or imaging to be seen clearly. The Crescent Nebula is another area of glowing hydrogen gas, and the Large Veil Nebula is the remains of a star that went supernova about 15,000 years ago. Scorpius is easily seen in the south throughout the summer. We've already related the story of his attempted interference in Hercules' battle with the Hydra. Scorpius is one of the few constellations whose stars look exactly like what it's supposed to be, and so spotting him is very easy. 
Next to him is Sagittarius, the archer, but he looks nothing like an archer. We find him by looking for an asterism, the teapot. This area of the sky has many beautiful objects. Next to Antares, the bright red star who is the heart of the scorpion, there's a bright globular cluster, Messier 4. The Milky Way passes right through this area of the sky, and there are many emission nebulas. The brightest ones are the Lagoon Nebula, the Trifid Nebula, the Swan or Omega Nebula, and the Eagle Nebula, which contains the so-called Pillars of Creation, in which new star formation is taking place. The pillars were made famous by an iconic Hubble Space Telescope image. Near the teapot's spout is a large open cluster named after Claudius Ptolemy, because he was the first person to record it. It's visible to the naked eye. The center of Milky Way is in this area of the sky as well. At the center of the Milky Way, some 26,000 light years from us, is a massive black hole. The black hole is called Sagittarius A star. It has a mass of about 3.6 million suns. We know this from observations of the orbits of the stars close to it, which have been tracked since 1995. Not only do their orbits allow us to measure the invisible object's mass, but they are precise enough to provide another proof of Einstein's theory of general relativity. Although we can't see the black hole, because its gravity is so great that radiation can't escape it, we can see gas falling into it, which is heated by friction and emits in the infrared. This is shown as a loop on the left. The Event Horizon Telescope, a collection of microwave and radio wave instruments scattered around the world, is attempting to visualize Sagittarius A star. The Event Horizon team recently imaged the black hole in galaxy Messier 87, which weighs at least 6 billion tons. It shows the black hole as a black circle surrounded by light from more distant stars that is bent around it by gravity. The results for Sagittarius A star may come this year or next. This is a part of the Milky Way further south than Scorpius. It can't be seen from New York, but it can be seen from Hawaii in the spring. Alpha and Beta Centauri are two of the closest stars to Earth. Alpha is only four light years away, and it was recently shown to have a planet. The coal sack is a dust cloud made up of soot-like particles that obscures light from stars behind it. And the Southern Cross is famous to voyagers who sail below the equator. Every culture has its unique take on the sky. The Incas made constellations from the prominent dust clouds in the Milky Way. The Lama comes out in the sky over Cuzco, the Incan capital, in November. There's a myth that tells of a great black Lama who came down to Earth to drink from all the natural springs and rivers of the world, and who also had to drink from the ocean because otherwise the world would flood. The people who live where the Lama descended to Earth were repaid with beautiful wool and great fortune and this constellation cares for all the other llamas on the earth. It even has a baby llama suckling at her breast. Further down the Milky Way, the Incas saw a partridge and a toad. If you want to read the original sources of the Greek myths that are associated with the constellations, I recommend Robin Hard's excellent translation of Eratosthenes, Aratus, and a later Roman astronomer, Hyginus. If you're interested in observing with a small telescope, Turn Left at Orion is one of the best guidebooks for new astronomers. And you can always come to Westchester Amateur Astronomers star parties once they start up again, hopefully this summer. There's always more to talk about in astronomy, but we've reached the end of our time. If you're interested in astronomy, check out Westchester Amateur Astronomers, your local astronomy club. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions.